Welcome to the Augsburg panel with your host, Jake Zabel. I'm having trouble hearing you, Jake. His internet is um, uh, transported on the back of, you know, outback creatures. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, 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 we might... <laughs> We might um, want to turn turn off the the cameras for better sound. I think it takes a lot of, if they have to uh, transport the the pictures too. Now I can only see Mark. I can Mark, only you see didn't you. turn your. I didn't turn mine off. You're the one who suggested. No. I'm not turning mine off. I like looking <laughs> okay, at you. Okay. You guys okay, can all okay. look at me. <laughs> Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Augsburg Panel. The Augsburg Panel is a monthly Q&A style theological podcast produced by the Order of Knight George, where I get a panel of three Lutheran theologians, or more depending on the panel, to come and answer listener questions. If anyone out there would like to have their questions answered by future panels, they can send them to us either via Facebook or they can email us at knightgeorge at outlook.com. Dot au. Uh, if they'd like to listen to any of the previous Augsburg panels or any of the other content put out by the Order of Night George, they can find us on SoundCloud, iTunes, YouTube, or just head to our website, um, www.nightgeorge.info. So this is our March 2020 panel with the three panelists, um, Magnus, Matthew, and Mark. This is our March Madness. Um, we'll get each panelist to give their introduction. Uh, first, we'll start with Pastor Magnus Sorensen from Denmark. Magnus, would you like to introduce yourself, tell the people where you're from, what congregation you serve? and Yeah, uh, I'm a pastor in uh, Augustana Lutheran Church in uh, Denmark, in Aarhus, <coughs> Denmark. Uh, I've been a pastor there for 13 years. Uh, we left an, another church uh, 13 years ago and uh, started this church. We were formerly in fellowship with the Missouri Synod and part of a, a church that was a sister church of the, uh, of the Missouri Synod. Uh, and I was called as a pastor right after we, uh, we left uh, and have been there for 13 years. I've been trained at the University of De- uh, Aarhus in Denmark and... Uh, studied a year in Fort Wayne with Mark, actually, uh, and uh, then I've taken afterwards a law degree, and I uh, work in uh, with law uh, as a day job. It's a very small congregation, so they they can't support me full time uh, or anything near to that. So uh, I have a day job too. Yeah, and then I'm uh, part of the Co Elk. I'm part of the Co Elk and uh, in fellowship with uh, with Jake as part of the Co Elk. Cool. And what's the Kyok stand for, for the listeners? Oh, yeah, the Confessional Orthodox Evangelical Lutheran uh, Communion. And our second panellist for this month is, path, uh, is Pastor Matt Fenn from Canada. Matt, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, I'm Pastor Matt Fenn. I am pastor of St. Peter's Evangelical Lutheran Church. Uh, I've been a pastor uh, at this church for about nine months. This is my... Uh, first call. Uh, I recently graduated uh, uh, from about a year ago then from uh, Concordia uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary in St. Catharines, Ontario. I'm part of uh, Lutheran Church Canada uh, in fellowship with Missouri Synod. And you're also now connected with uh, Pastor Jordan Cooper and his Justin Sinner project. Yes, um, I'm on the board for Justin Sinner. It's um, Pastor Cooper started it. They just received a, a 501-3 charitable status. Um, their mission is to um, bring uh, Lutheran theological education and publications, podcasts, that kind of thing, um, republishing a lot of old uh, public domain works uh, that have since fallen out of print and providing uh, uh, theological training via the Wiedner Institute uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, they're doing a lot of good work over there. Um, and uh, uh, I, th- I think it's they're providing a valuable service for the church. 
Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of the well, I've got a couple of the books that jo- uh, Jordan put out with the Justin Center publications. I particularly like actually those the Lutheran Commentary series um, that he's put out again. There, I'd recommend everyone listening to go and get them if you're looking for a good Lutheran uh, commentary. And our final panelist for this month is. Reverend Mark Preuss from America. Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so I, I'm, I live in uh, Laramie, Wyoming. I'm a pastor at St. Andrew's Lutheran Church and Campus Center. So it's most of my parishioners are students. Um, and so I don't have most of my parishioners right now because of the plague. But uh, um, but the, it's, it's a beautiful little church and um, have a lot of young families now. It's great. I'm married to Becky. It'll be 15 years in June, and God's given us five daughters and five sons. And uh, let's see, I went to uh, Concordia Theological Seminary. My first year was when Magnus was there, and that was awesome. And he used to smoke a pipe, and I smoked cigarettes, and we had very good theological conversation. I remember one time there was a good argument going between my brother David and Peter Scare, and I forget what, basically, Peter Scare accidentally denied the, the, uh, that the keys belong to everybody. And Magnus steps in and says, anybody can forgive sins. <laughs> it was a great moment. Anyway, uh, I, so that's where I got my, my MDiv, and then I got an MA in Classics at the University of Kansas and spent my first four years um, as pastor at Faith Lutheran Church in Wiley, Texas, and teaching also at Faith Lutheran High School, um, and then I've been here for five years. So, yeah. As I have asked all the uh, previous members of the Preuss families that have been on this podcast, where do you fit into the great Preuss dynasty? <laughs> I should just ignore the question, dynasty. What an insulting word. I uh, uh, So my father is Rolf. And I'm his fifth son out of 11. And, um, and then he, he's, his father is Robert Preuss, who was uh, one of the faithful five at the seminary, at Seminex, at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. And then he was president of the uh, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. But he was a pastor for 10 years before that. And then, yeah, so then and his brother is Jack Preuss. Uh, the former president of the Misery Synod. So, well, we should get get on with the show then. So, uh, Magnus and Matthew have both been on the show before. They're both returning guests for the panel. Mark's the only one who's new. Rules are pretty simple. We go through the questions. You guys will each be given a chance to answer. The order will change per question. And basically, this show does not only allow, but actually encourages and supports having theological discussions and debates where there is disagreement. However, I do request that we keep all the debates uh, respectful, loving, um, no name-calling, no emotionally charged arguing, no biting, fighting, no hitting below the belt, no eye-gouging, you know, standard um, theological rules when it comes to theological debates. Um, so we'll get underway with our first question, which is this, this one I moved to the first question because it's actually kind of relevant to the current situation with all the coronavirus lockdowns and, uh, churches being shut due to all the quarantining laws. And the question is, can a pastor consecrate the Lord's Supper via, you know, Skype, video chat, whatever you want to call it. And so I'll get, um, Pastor Mark then to start with this one. <clears throat> That's me. Yeah, I would I would say no uh, for several reasons. Um, one is that in uh, Jesus had them with him when he distributed the sacrament, and he said, "Do this in remembrance of me." Well, do what you say the words and you distribute it. Now, Lutherans have been very good about. Uh, saying that, hey, you don't need to do every little thing that Jesus does. So, for example, we don't break the host uh, at the words, he broke it, as if we need to uh, 
um, reenact what happened, you know, as if that's what the, the main thing is in the sacrament. Um, and so uh, most Lutherans purposely don't do that to, to take a stand and say the words are what do this. Um, but you can't, just because the words are what affect the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the sacrament, it is still needs to be done according to his institution. And um, there's, a, there's an old Latin saying, extra uh, usu, usu uh, nullus, nullum sacramentum. Outside of the use, there is no sacrament. And the use is distributing Christ's body and blood. The second point that I would make uh, includes distributing Christ's body and blood to people who are there. The second point that I would make is that in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul mentions a couple times, when you come together, right? So when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper. This assumes that you have to come together to have this meal. It is a meal that you share with other people. And, um, and, and also, he says, wait for each other at the end. When you come, you know, wait for each other. And so these commands of Paul can't be obeyed at all. Uh, if, if you do it over uh, phone or, or online or whatever. Another thing, too, is that it's crazy. Like, when do they, you know, if it's recorded, does, you know, is, is there some magical incantation uh, uh, power with the words so that you can just, like, save the video? Like, if, if they do this video and then somebody says, okay, he said the words and, you know, we're going to have, we're going to have church at home and have the Lord's Supper at home and we'll just save the video and do it at 3 p.m., then what, you know, what, these are just magical words that the pastor spoke, then you never need to have another service again. You can just use that again every time. I mean, the things get really ridiculous when, when you start to look at it. And also, it's completely unnecessary because there's no, and this is my final point, there's no um, uh, 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 emergency communion. You might be able to think of like one in a billion or something like that, but you don't define the rule by an exception. And, um, there's no there's no emergency communion as we've been experiencing. We, I was just talking to Magnus, and uh, there were a couple of weeks where our parishioners didn't have the Lord's Supper, and um, they went without it. There, the 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 Danes when they came to America uh, went for a couple of years without the Lord's Supper because they weren't they were waiting for a pastor. Um, and 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 finally, like if if there is such a circumstance where there's a group of believers who need the sacrament, then as soon as can as soon as it can be done, um, uh, one of those men needs to be set aside. He needs to be set apart for the ministry and trained and taught so that he can be the pastor to those other people. This is this is what um, this is what the Lutheran Confessions uh, 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 have in 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 their assumptions. It was what Luther counsels in his letter to what was it? Those Bohemians, the somebody in Prague. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that's so. That's my that's my uh, answer to that. Don't don't do it. If you do it, you're 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 doing something wrong. Matthew, do you got any further comments on this? No, I, I think uh, Mark did a fantastic job answering that. Um, I would just note that the CTCR of the LCMS and uh, put out a, a statement on communion and COVID-19, which references an earlier thing, which also follows very lo- very much along the lines of what uh, Mark has said, um, that um, you cannot consecrate the Lord's Supper uh, via video or electronic means, and, um, that kind of thing. So... Yeah, Mark was able to cover most of the points that I had thought of as well. Uh, but it, it is the official position of LCC, LCMS to not do that. <laughs> Pastor Magnus, you got any final comments on this? Yeah, yeah. I would say that the, there are two questions. You raise the question if he can, and the, that's whether it's valid. Uh, and then there is the question if he should, if he, if he could, should he do it? And I think the main reason why I think he, he can't do it, that it's not a valid consecration, is that that in consecration, the pastor sets specific elements apart. And I think that can only happen if he, has, if he actually has access to these elements. I mean, he took bread and he said, it's not just a command that we should do this, but it's, it's really the thing that what bread is consecrated here. Is the bread out in the kitchen also consecrated? Uh, if the words are, are there, 
because the breath would be able to hear it if it had ears? No, of course not. Uh, so there is specific elements that are to be set apart in consecration. And I don't think a pastor can do that, at least with certainty, uh, during the inter- uh, through the internet. And even if he could, he shouldn't, because it's also the pastor's job to distribute communion ad- and administer communion. That's really an exercise of the office of the keys, uh, which should only happen by the pastor in the church. So I would say no, he can't, and no, he shouldn't, if, even if he could. And we'll move on to question number two. And this one is, is Melchizedek the pre-incarnate Christ? So this is an interesting one. I've heard this one bandied around. I see different commentators often go back and forth on whether they think he is or isn't. So we'll get uh, Magnus then to start with this question. Do you think Melchizedek was the pre-incarnate Christ? Why, why not? Luther would say that he's probably Sem, as, as, as most have done in, in church history, uh, or many people have at least, and, and, and Judaists have too. I don't think that, that he is Sem. That connection was made uh, pretty late by Judaists, and I think there is a connection to the issue of whether one should follow the Septuagint chronology or the Masoretic ch- text on the chronology. The idea of some of the rabbis was to, to get actually Christ removed from from uh, Melchizedek, uh, because if Melchizedek is Sem, then they, then they could argue that it was inherited, the priesthood was inherited uh, by Aaron from Melchizedek. And I think that's some of what uh, Hebrews is arguing against. Now, in Hebrew, it seems like Christ and Melchizedek are compared and not the same per- person. At least it could seem that way. Uh, I don't think that uh, when it says that he's like the Son of Man, uh, like the Son of God, that, that that rules out that he is the Son of God in Hebrews 7, uh, 3, because uh, the same thing could be said about Christ in Revelation 1, 13, that he's like the Son of Man. But I think the, 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 the things that are actually compared, where Melchizedek and Christ are actually compared, shows that, that the, uh, indicates that they are the same. Uh, it says about uh, Melchizedek in uh, Hebrews 7, 2 to 3, He's first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he's also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He's without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. I mean, if he was Sem, he was not without a father or mother. He, was, he had the most famous father uh, of all. So, so clearly that cannot be the case. Uh, and he doesn't have a beginning of days nor end of life, but he's a priest forever. And again, in uh, Hebrews 7, 15 to 17, it says this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. So that's the the point of comparison between these two priesthoods. So I think the, the comparison is not between Melchizedek and Christ as persons, but be- between the priesthoods. And there is a difference be- because Christ is the, the, the incarnate Son of God and Melchizedek is the pre-incarnate. Something also interesting is, is that in one of the Qumran texts in, from around 100 uh, before Christ, Melchizedek is seen as such a messianic uh, angelic being. And only after the emergence of, of Christianity did the rabbis begin to see Melchizedek as, as Sem. So I think there is a, a is a clear connection, uh, and I think I think it is the same uh, the same person, uh, in spite of uh, Luther disagreeing with me. Thank you. Um, we'll get Mark then to uh, to answer this question. Secondly, um, have you got any comments on this? Well, Magnus has utterly convinced me. I've been leaning towards this um, for a while, and uh, you know, looking at the Septuagint things as well. But um, his compare, like especially being the, com- the the difference is the one of of, of the priesthoods, and and he's explicitly um, excluded from the Aaronic priesthood. And the Psalm what was it Psalm one ten um, prophesies this about Christ. So um, according to the order of Melchizedek, I think that he's also right that just to say that it says he's like um, the Son of God doesn't necessarily exclude him. You can see the same thing in Daniel and other places um, and in Revelation. 
Um, and it's kind of like, you know, you, you get the uh, Cyril of Jerusalem. Uh, he uses homoousios or um, of similar substance um, to refer to Christ. Uh, and he's not a heretic for doing that. <clears throat> it was just before the controversy came about. He meant the same thing. And so we can we can we can learn that from the scriptures as well. So yeah, I've I'm pretty I've been leaning towards Magnus's position for a while, but I'm that was very well said, and I'm I, I agree. Cool. And Matthew, uh, not much to add there. Magnus covered most of it. Um, I, I also agree. Uh, I, I think w- what we have going on here is typology. That Melchizedek is a type of Christ. Um, and without going into a lengthy thing about what typology is, uh, I, I think typology is the safer way to, to go. If I could uh, interject really quickly, Jake, uh, not to get in, I mean, typology would be a different person by definition. So David is a type of Christ in many of his ways. Solomon is a type of Christ. Joshua is a type of Christ. He leads them into the promised land. But but Jesus, the Son of God, is not David, is not Solomon. Like, he, he's different. So, looking at it, if, if he were a type, then he would be an historical figure who prefigures Christ. And that's an acceptable position. I That's the position I held for most, well, until Mag. That's a position I was kind of holding until Magnus uh, proved me wrong. So, um, so I would, I would just, you know, for the sake of the distinction... Um, a type, Magnus, are you, I'm right, right? You're not saying he's a type, you're saying he is the Son of God, right? I'm saying he is the Son of God. I mean, I think, if I'm into right, I think you could say that, I mean, he, you, could, you could say that the form in which he appeared to Abraham was a type of, I mean, I, you, you could argue that maybe, because he's, it's clearly the pre-incarnate Christ, it's the same person, but it is in another form. It's, it's without the human nature, and I mean, Normally, we, we can only speak about it as different persons and, and because we're not normally dealing with the Godhead and uh, in, in two different forms. So I don't know if you can stretch typology a bit there and, and say that, that you could say that his appearance to Abraham uh, as the pre-incarnate Christ was a type of the incarnate Christ. I, I don't know if you can say that. But Yeah, it makes me like, for example, um, the angel of the Lord, like, for example, the burning bush is a type of of christ and yet christ was there you know yeah but yeah but um but like the man that jacob wrestled with would we say that that's a type of christ we i i suppose in the way it is form yes but he actually is the pre-incarnate christ you know yeah so so i see what you're saying i think that's yeah that's that's a helpful way of looking at it yeah um uh i must have misunderstood magnus no i i do not think that melchizedek is a pre-incarnate Christ. I don't think, I think, Mel, I definitely side under the other position. Melchizedek is a historical person who is typologically, who is a type who prefigures Christ. And the author of the, what the author of the Hebrews is doing is he's saying, look, we have this Melchizedek guy who kind of pops out of nowhere and he has no um, genealogy, and that's kind of like Jesus. Uh, and and look, this Melchizedek is a priest, and he's a king at the same time. Um, uh, so uh, that's like Jesus. Jesus is a priest like that. He's a priest, and he's a king. Um, uh, so I, I don't think we need to say that he's Jesus. Um, otherwise, he wouldn't be king of a place called Salem. Um, but um, I, uh, yeah, I, I would take the other position. Cool. Well, as I mentioned in the introduction to the question, plenty of Lutheran commentators go back and forth and disagree on this. I just, when I, um, I wrote a sermon on this, on the text from Hebrews uh, last year, and I noticed the different opinions of just the different Lutheran commentaries I was reading. So, yeah, it's quite a like open question among Lutherans. And I think, as Magnus pointed out, Matthew, Luther actually um, would fall on your side of the category in that way. But we'll move on to question number three. Uh, this is an interesting one again. Um, is Jesus descended from Jezebel? Um, the, 
the question gives a bit of context as well to the question where it says Jesus is descended from Joash, the son of Ahaziah, the son of Athaliah, the daughter of Ahab, and assumed also the daughter of Jezebel. Um, I did look this up. The Bible never explicitly says Athaliah is the daughter of Jezebel, although I think we can probably assume that she was, but I'll leave that to you guys to answer in the question. I'll get Matt then to answer first. Yeah, I went to um, the account in Kings, um, and I can't see, uh, I might have missed it, but I don't see where Ahab has another wife. Uh, so barring evidence that he had another wife, um, I would say, yeah, that Jesus is a, a descendant of uh, Jezebel. Uh, that shouldn't bother us too much. Jesus is a descendant of Rahab, and Rahab's a prostitute. Um, so... Yeah. And Magnus, your comments to this question? I'll say yes, probably. And Mark? Yeah, I uh, I was thinking about this because it's an interesting question. I, I remember thinking this when I was a kid because I was like interested in this kind of stuff. But we shouldn't speculate too much on genealogies, as the Bible says. Um, but I, I uh, like Paul tells both Timothy and Titus explicitly not to get too uh, carried away into this. But um I would uh, uh, note the difference is that you look at the women, you got Tamar, you got Rahab, you got Rahab, Tamar, Rahab, uh, Ruth, and Bathsheba. And um, you have with, with Tamar, she prostituted herself, but she was trying to be faithful. Judah said she's more righteous than I. With um, Rahab, she was a prostitute, but she wasn't after she was married, you know. Um, she was a Christian, uh, and Ruth was a Christian. Your God shall be my God. It's a beautiful story. Uh, and Bathsheba repented, you know, like they, the, she was a Christian, uh, as you can see with her, um, from, uh, supporting, uh, Solomon's kingship, which God had promised. So the Bible does mention ancestresses of Jesus who did not have, who had sordid tales surrounding them or f foreign blood, things like that. But all four of them are believers. And I think that's just important to, to remember. You know, the, the, point, the point wasn't just to, there are two points here. One is to show that Jesus actually redeemed uh, uh, our uh, sinners, real sinners. But also that he redeemed them for faith. You know, he redeemed them to believe. And so he kept the, the, all the women who are mentioned in 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 the uh, lineup are believers, you know. And a lot of the men aren't; they're wicked kings, you know. But but they were believers. And I think you know, with with Eve and with Mary too, um, and with Sarah, you know, th these are important. These are important things to remember. Um, and I, I don't know. I don't know what that means entirely. But I think that we should focus on. Also, that point, the point of faith, and not just um, uh, uh, not just dwelling on the sinfulness of, of, of the people. Sorry if I talk too long. That's all right. Um, we'll move on to question number four, which is, should old earth creationism be tolerated? And we'll get Mark to start with this one then. No. No, it shouldn't. Um, this is... Uh, it's it's the besides the fact that it is unreasonable and that the the scientific data you can find just as many scientific data supporting um, a younger Earth as their um, as they find uh, uh, anomalies or clues that the that things could be older. It's not just that it contradicts reason and is unreasonable. It's also that it contradicts the faith. And you, you can't make the days, I don't care what St. Augustine did, he was a Neoplatonist, come on, all right? Um, and, uh, and he didn't have the uh, controversy that we have today. And so if you're a Christian today, this is the controversy, and you need to take the right position. God created the world in six days. Those six days are explicitly, twice in Exodus, referred to as actual days of the week. And so the, the scripture interprets scripture. You simply cannot get away from it. And to try to make some sort of, well, science says this, and we can also believe this, and da-da-da-da, why? Why have the long earth? 
what happens to Adam and Eve? Are you are you acknowledging that we are the result of of, of mutations that God didn't create us and say it's very good? I mean, just so many things just just get destroyed when you when you hold the old earth creationism and and frankly, it's just the fear of the world, and the fear of these pompous and self-important academics who have been touting this ridiculous theory of evolution, which is just neo-paganism, for over a hundred and what, almost fifty years now. It's a stupid idea. It's it, look at this. You get, <clears throat> you have in the Greek. If you ever read Hesiod's uh, uh, Theogony, he, he wrote around the time of Homer, maybe a little bit after. He has the Theogony for the Greeks. You have chaos, and then from chaos comes Uranos, the heavens, and then um, and then from that from 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 Uranos comes Gaia, and Gaia is the most beautiful of all the planets. And so Uranos has sex with Gaia, and then that's where life comes. And man is basically eventually an afterthought. That, that 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 he's just created afterwards. He's not the crown at all of God's creation. You have a now compare this to evolution. You got a big bang, it explodes, there's chaos, and then from the chaos arises heavens, and then you get this one planet that's particularly beautiful, and through the relationship between the heavens and the earth, life comes and man is just an afterthought. It's just neo-pagan nonsense. And we just need to stand up against it and, and not get bogged down in all these details. Because they're going to want to do that. They're going to say, look at this tree. Well, look at the forest. It's a stupid idea. And so every Christian should be opposed to old earth creationism and should, and, and, and should do so confidently and not be afraid of the priests of academia. Cool. Thank you. Um, just before we get to the other guys, I just wanted to make a comment because I liked your comment there, how you connected like the evolutionary um, science and you can see how the similarities between it and like, you know, um, old paganisms. I've always found it interesting that a lot of other religions, other than Christianity, for example, Hinduism, they have like millions of years and stuff. It was part of their religion long before evolution ever came around. Like this concept that the universe is millions and billions of years old is just a thought within a lot of Eastern religions. Going, you know, that was what they already thought before we got to the scientific world. Oh yeah, that's Aristotle too. Yeah, that's the pagan. That's paganism. It's always been here. It's it's a, that's kind of like it's 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 really really old, you know. And um and we can't we can't tell the beginning or the end of it, which is true as far as you know. God has put eternity into the heart of man, but he can't tell the beginning to the end. That's Ecclesiastes. So they're bound by their natural understanding. They don't know God, and so they come up with these fanciful stories. And uh, it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, they're going to do it. Um, Pastor Magnus, did you like to give some comments to this question? Yes. Uh, no, I, I also don't think it should be tolerated in the church. Uh, we can disagree on the precise age of the church, and I'm starting to lean a bit toward the Septuagint chronology uh, for different reasons. But I do think that a six-day creation clearly taught in, uh, in Scripture in, in the young earth. So I, I would say no, and I think it's a doctrine, and therefore I think it's uh, the visit of church fellowship if, if 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 we disagree on on uh, on that issue and matthew your last uh, answer your question your answer oh boy um should old earth creationism be tolerated well first let's make sure we define what we mean um old earth creationism is not the same as theistic evolution neither is it the same as um evolutionary creation uh, so, you know, uh, old earth creationism is creationism, so it still rejects evolution, still believes in the um, actual creation of a, a literal Adam Eve, a, a, a literal fall and a literal garden, that kind of thing. Uh, so with that, um, we should always tolerate sound biblical exegesis. Um, to, that should be first and foremost. Um, there is good biblical, solid exegesis uh, on uh, Genesis. In fact, two of the uh, two of the leading commentaries on Genesis, Victor Hamilton's NICOT commentary on Genesis, uh, Wenham's Word Biblical Commentary on Genesis, uh, C. John Collins' commentary on the first four chapters of Genesis, John Walton's commentary 
on Genesis as well as his popular works. Um, you have works from Meredith Klein, Bruce Waltke, Kenneth Kitchen, John Lennox. Um, there are a, a host of responsible conservative scholars um, who have a sound exegesis of the text and who aren't um, doing it to, to peddle to academia, but who st don't think that a responsible exegesis of the of Genesis uh, can lead to young earth creationism. Additionally, there is no consensus in the early church. Um, the church was clearly divided about the nature of the creation days, um, and those rejecting the calendar day interpretation were never deemed heretical. Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Ambrose, Augustine, Hilary of Poitiers, all of them rejected the calendar day view uh, and instead uh, believed that the creation was instantaneous. In fact, no, uh, I would, no prominent church doctrinal statement or confession of faith discussed these matters until the 20th century. Uh, so because these issues were not listed as, as part of the rule of faith, um, it should be considered a, a secondary issue uh, and not a primary one. Um, so I, I would say that there, there's three views that can be tolerated, young earth creationism, old earth creationism, and the um, f literary framework view. What shouldn't be tolerated is evolutionary creationism and theistic evolution. Any final comment before we move on? Uh, yeah. In as far as uh, a couple things, one is I'd like to know exactly what exegesis could possibly give a different position. I've read, I haven't read all these works, but I've read the position several times and I don't understand how the exegesis of the text um, could possibly be anything other than, than an actual six days. I also, um, the believing that it's instantaneous, this is, you have to, first of all, origin is, is the likely origin of this. That was funny. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> origin was the likely origin of this, who was a total, he spiritualized everything. He allegorized everything. He, 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 he had, had placed very little value on the literal sense of anything. And, and Augustine was also influenced by Neoplatonism. And um, admits when he talks about this that he just doesn't understand how it had to have been just immediately. Well, he's putting his reason above scripture. And and I haven't read Hilary of, of Poitier, but um, I'm assuming he's very influenced by Augustine in the, in the same manner. Um, you can you can uh, um, read in uh, Augustine's Confessions when he when he uh, starts to, he, he was bothered by the stories in the Old Testament, but then he learned to accept them because Ambrose said, no, they're meant to be allegorized. So Ambrose was under the same, and I've read a lot of Ambrose too, he's under the same type of, um, of, uh, of exegetical tradition, which it does not stand with Lutheranism, which does not stand with um, the, the revelation of the gospel and the defense of the literal text against its abuse that had been, um, that had been tolerated in the church, of course, for a long time, but um, but led to disaster, had disastrous results on actual doctrine and dogma. And considering the fact that we're now being attacked, like this is attacked, the, 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 the meaning of the words is being attacked, I don't see how this is acceptable um, to believe in, and I also don't know, like, what the point is of old earth creationism, like, why, what, what, what if it doesn't, if it doesn't help, if it doesn't help, uh, if it doesn't help support or 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 buoy up the claims of the Epicureans, the evolutionists, then why? I just, I don't, I've never understood that. So I, I'd like to get a response from from uh, Matthew. That's okay. Can, can I make a comment too? Um, yeah. Uh, does Matt want to just respond first to Mark, and then we can throw Magnus in as well, or? Do you need to go before Matthew Magnus? Let Magnus go first. Okay, my the, the primary reason why I don't think we can tolerate it is Exodus 20, which refers to uh, to uh, to the six days of creation when it speaks about the the, the Sabbath day. I mm -hmm. don't think that they can be interpreted in different ways in, uh, because of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the one question. That's the the six day creation. I I I can't see. I mean, the framework theory is a theory, but. I don't think you can prove it from scripture. What you can prove is what 
what Exodus 20 says, which is clear. The other reason and the other question, of course, is whether the genealogies in uh, primarily in, in Genesis uh, uh, 11 and uh, and 4, if they are correct. And and uh, and I think that even if you say that there are gaps in the genealogies, that doesn't really matter because it says how old a person was when when the next one was uh, was born. So so uh, so and and then we can argue about the Masoretic text versus the the Septuagint, but but uh, either way, the 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 genealogies, whether or not there are gaps there, doesn't matter because it says how old the person was when he when the next next one was was uh, begotten. So that, those are the my two main reasons why I don't think that this that that you can hold to this view and and uh, and still hold to to uh, to what Scripture says. And Matthew, your response now. Um, yeah. Uh, so first, uh, in response to Mark, um, yeah, it, 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 origin is not the or, origin. <laughs> um, if anybody's the origin, it's actually Philo uh, of Alexandria. Uh, Philo has the same interpretation, almost identical as Augustine's, if you check his works. Um, uh, now, th- that doesn't help... Um, me in the sense, but because Philo was just as much influenced by Platonism as the other, as the other ones, um, uh, being influenced by Platonism um, and proving Platonism are wrong are, are two different things. Um, uh, so you you can say, well, Augustine was influenced by Platonism here, and and that's why all these guys that were influenced by Platonism and and this kind of thing. Well. Um, you know that that's a genetic fallacy. You have to show why they're wrong. Uh, they might have a different philosophy, a different philosophical outlook than you do, uh, but we would have to go back and prove that they're wrong. For the record, I am not necessarily an old Earth creationist. Um, uh, I, I just uh, that's not the question. The question is should it be tolerated. <laughs> um, uh, so we'll leave my opinions to another day. It is playing devil advocate. Um, I think, though, if not necessarily devil's advocate, but I, 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 in response to the second part, I, when Mark said that he can't understand how um, it can be believed, we could get into the weeds on this, and it would take us a long time. My suggestion is if anybody wants to um, get into this and they want to see the best cases, go read the guys I mentioned. Victor Hamilton's NICOT. Wenham's Word Biblical Commentary, go read C. John Collins, John Walton, uh, Kenneth Kitchen, uh, Bruce Waltke, Meredith Klein, uh, John Lennox. Read those guys, especially the, 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 the Hamilton and Wenham and, and Walton and Collins. Those, those four are, are the top. Are, are, uh, their commentaries are well respected across the bounds. I say go read them, dig in, and... and uh, do the exegesis yourself. Um, uh, and then in regards to the, the Magnus' um, question, we could get into Je- Exodus 20, but um, um, guys like uh, C. John Collins are going to argue for that the days in Genesis 1 are analogical. They're not literal. They are <coughs> analogical days. What does that mean? Go read C. John Collins and find out. Um, uh, in terms of the the genealogies, we're going to get that. We're going to get to that down. Um, genealogies is the last question on the list here. Um, but genealogies are not meant to be taken literally. Period. End of story. Okay. Well, we'll move on now to the next question. Uh, this one we got plenty of interesting ones for the, for this um, list. Uh, this one is. Is sodomy within heterosexual relationships permissible or sinful? So I think we can all agree that like homosexuality and that is sin. But the question this is asking is, is um, sodomy permissible as long as it's within a heterosexual couple? Um, yes or no? And we'll get uh, Matt. You can start with this one then. Joy. <laughs> um before I, I mention my response, let me say that what the church doesn't want to be policing what happens in a bedroom. But despite that, um, 
the small catechism in an ex- the explanation of the commandment, uh, you shall not kill, says that we should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body. Um, and, uh, medical studies will show that um, uh, anal sex hurts and harms your neighbor in his body. Um, therefore, um, I would say no, it is not permissible. It is sinful. Uh, Mark, your answer. Yeah, I, um, I agree with Matt. And uh, what, I, what I tell um, uh, couples in marriage counseling is I don't get into, I don't say those words because they're icky, but um, I say don't imitate the Gentiles and animals. That's what I say. Don't imitate the Gentiles and animals and show respect for the purpose of your bodies. And this is, it's, it's no coincidence. Um, people who practice birth control uh, with um, uh, just, just for their own convenience, for money's sake and for pleasure, um, they, they're, they, they are what Luther calls them. They're, they're sodomites in a certain sense, because they are, that's exactly what sodomy is. There's no way life is going to come from this. And so why would you do it? And so that's the the, the bigger, deeper, uh, fundamental issue is what's the purpose of it. And everybody wants to say, well, what? So you just, the only purpose is having babies. It's like, well, if, if that were the only purpose, it would still be a pretty noble and good purpose. But it's it's you 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 should never lose sight of that. When you do lose sight of that, um, then you have what we have today, you know, where did people just use sex merely as recreation and merely for pleasure, uh, same as people use food not for nutrition but merely for pleasure, or um, people use sleep not just for rest but merely for pleasure out of laziness. And so you can't you can never push away the um, the 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 fundamental purpose of of marriage you know um you have a partnership under god and you have children and you have avoiding fornication so imitating the fornicators isn't exactly a good thing to do it's a bad thing to do so that's my position cool and magnus uh, well, I, I agree with Matt. I think uh, anal intercourse is, is unnatural. It should be self-evident. Whether all non coital intercourse is inherently sinful, uh, I don't think I can answer that as clearly from Scripture alone. Uh, from the point of view of uh, Aristotelian Thomistic natural law ethics, one can say a bit more and reject non coital intercourse, including birth control. And philosophically, I can go with that a long way. Uh, support and I can support such reasoning when it comes to civil righteousness. I'm not sure I can put it on the on the same level as scripture. Uh, so while I might be able to make recommendation and advice and pastoral practice and especially warn against acting against conscience, I don't think I'm certain enough to clearly condemn and and hence excommunicate everything that might have been seen as sodomy in history. Uh, some of it certainly, and uh, and intercourse is some of it. Uh, but but no, I I can't say it with certainty with all of it. I I agree, um, Magnus. Um, well, we'll move on now to the next question, which is your position on membership in Boy Scouts, veteran associations, and other organisations that have an oath to a uh, nebulous God. Magnus, why don't you go first? Um, well, joint prayer with with syncretists and and praying to an an uh, an unknown God is clearly wrong. Uh, I'm not sure whether a joint oath indicates confession of a common belief or that you are worshipping the, the same God. Uh, I mean, you could question the, the Pledge of Allegiance of the United States, too, that way. And Paul does speak about an unknown God. So there is a natural knowledge of God. And and I'm not I'm not really sure what that oath indicates. If it indicates that you share common belief in the same God, or if you just recognize that there there is a God uh, to whom everyone is responsible. And 
I must admit I haven't studied the the oath in detail, but but uh, I would be skeptical. Uh, I would not let let my own kids do that. Mark. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think that. Um, I think I agree with uh, Magnus, uh, but I would I would go a little bit farther because of you know, we should never take an oath that God doesn't command us to take. So we should fear and love God. You should not let's not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, right? So we you should we should fear and love God so that we do not. Um, uh, so that we do not l- curse, swear, um, use satanic arts is how they, or, you know, use magic or whatever, lie or deceive by his name, call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. And so, like, I have this problem here where people join these fraternities and sororities and they require an oath of them. Well, what authority do they have to require an oath? The only authorities that can require an oath are the ones God has instituted because you're calling upon the authority of God. So the government... Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God, I swear. You, that's not contrary to Jesus' command. Um, uh, don't swear, you know. And same as uh, in the church, your baptism, you know, that's an oath. Uh, your confirmation is an oath. Um, and even in, in 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 the home, in times past, the parents are the ones who administered the marriage oaths, right? So so when you have actual authorities commanding an oath, we can make one. But otherwise, no. And also, as far as the, the nebulous, nebulousness of the God, I mean, this is there is a God who is worshipped in in um, in America at least, who is this 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 uh, uh, Unitarian deity that anybody can believe in, and so you have to be very careful about this. And that's why I always I have um, I think one scout who's a member, and I'm I'm always warning him about this. You know, you don't take oaths, etc. and um, uh, especially lodges, you know, uh, things like that. Um, I've, I've always been annoyed by the under God and the pledge of allegiance. And I wouldn't sing God bless America standing next to, um, Nancy Pelosi or, or, uh, um, well, she claims to believe in the same God or some Muslim member of Congress. I wouldn't do it, you know, because it's not good. So I, we, we, we gotta, we gotta, um, I guess we we have to maintain um, uh, uh, or recognize we have to recognize that there is a natural knowledge of God, like Magnus said. But we should never, ever, ever compromise the name of the Holy Trinity, so that people get the impression by our words or actions that the God that we are swearing to, praying to, praising, in uh, uh, speaking about, is the same as theirs when it isn't. Um, uh, it's an idol that they're that they're using. So that's I don't know if that's clear, but that's my answer. And Matthew, do you have any final comments on this question? No, not much. I think both um, Mark and Magnus have covered it pretty pretty good. Uh, we should avoid anything that smacks of syncretism um, and anything that compromises our our triune God. Uh, and I and I think though that what they said is correct. Uh, so question seven, and I'm just going to make this one then an open question. Just just jump in whenever you want. Um, what is your thoughts on the new evangelical heritage version of the Bible? So for those who don't know, that's the um, translation of the scriptures that was put out by the Wisconsin Synod. And that was, uh, I think they got the New Testament out in time for the 500 year anniversary of the Reformation. I believe the Old Testament is out now. Um, if not, you guys can correct me on that. But um, open question. Just if you've read it or whatever, give me your opinion on this translation. Uh, maybe I'll start since I didn't have much to say on the last one. I, I, I was familiar with the idea that this was a translation. But up until this question, I didn't have any chance to dig into it. So I went to Romans, which is my what I did my dissertation in seminary on. And so it's what I'm most familiar with. Um, And so I I took a look at the first uh, few chapters of Romans. What I don't like about the translation is how sometimes in in the Greek, um, something's ambiguous. Um, I, I prefer if something's ambiguous in the Greek, I want it to be ambiguous in the English text too. Um, it's not the job of the translator to interpret the text for you, even if their interpretation is correct. Um, it's the job of the pastor teaching the word to interpret the text. I feel 
the, the evangelical heritage version, at least from what I've seen in the first couple chapters of Romans, um, does too much interp- interpreting. I'd much rather the text um, be trained, if the text is ambiguous in the Greek, translated ambiguously in in your English. Um, and the other pastors, any comments? I, I haven't read it, and I like what Matt said. I haven't read it. I, I thought the, the, the natural English speakers should answer this. So we'll move on then to the next question, which is, if a pastor has an affair, should he be defrocked? And then the the question goes on further, though. Can you answer this question in light of the David and Bathsheba incident? David committed adultery, and yet he was not removed from his office as king. Therefore, should a pastor who commits adultery be removed from his office as pastor? Mark, do you want to go first? Uh, No, yeah. A bishop shall be blameless. It's... uh... Um, you, you can't, uh, once the world can point out something that, like a position that you held, that you were a hypocrite, and the world can blame you for that, then people will use it to reject the teaching uh, against the sin, and, uh, and the name of Christ is blasphemed. And so the person who is caught in a, an op- a pastor is caught in an open scandal should have shame and uh, show humility and realize that he that God has removed him from the office, um, and he does this through the congregation, just like he called him through the congregation. Um, the, the The appeal to David is um, uh, is is absurd, and for two reasons. One is, well, what are you going to do with Paul's words then? You know, like, and and you can't say, oh, you, well, nobody's blameless. We're not talking. Everybody knows that this word blameless doesn't mean sinless. It means open to public shame and public reproof and um and secondly david is david is a uh an an exceptional character um in the bible and he suffered tremendously because of it um and uh his it wasn't he, he was king not merely for the purpose of ruling over the country um and he was a prophet uh but 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 for the sake of the seed for the sake of the promised seed of christ and so, so to use that as, as justification, like I know, um, who's that guy? I forget what his name is. He was in Arkansas and started his own church. Daniel Price. Yeah, yeah, Price. Yeah, he starts. He, he posts on Twitter or something. Um, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted unto you. So he read Psalm fifty-one and used it to justify his own. Um, you know, his being able to stay in the office after he had committed adultery with one of his own parishioners. And um, I mean, that's a scandal, you know, and and it harmed, greatly harmed the congregation there. It also, he had nobody, you know, he has no brothers in in office to rebuke him or to, to have any discipline at all. Um, and that's what happens. They become rogue. You know, you get people um, who have been defrocked preaching in other pulpits and things like that. And then gaining a uh, wide internet following and things like that. And it, it makes people, it confuses the common people who confuse the forgiveness of sins with, um, uh, with maintaining the, the rights and privileges of some office that you have. And, and um, I think it's, it shows a very skewed sense of justification and sanctification. Matthew, your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I, I, I agree with Mark there. Um, Put even simpler, um, yes, he should be defrocked. Uh, no, the David situation doesn't apply. David's a king, not a pastor. And Magnus, any further comments? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of this. Uh, there's a difference between a king and a pastor, and even between a king and a, and a priest in the Old Testament. I don't, um, of course, we can't put the same rules uh, on pastors as, as the Old Testament priesthood, but the uh, the fact that the Old Testament priesthood had had the had certain rules uh, that put it aside, as that they could not marry a prostitute or a woman who had been defiled or a woman who had been divorced, shows that there there was a distinction between between the the office that dealt with uh, with spiritual things and the the the, the kingdom of the of the left, uh, even though it was a a prophet king. Uh, so and I think so. Therefore, I think we cannot. You at least you cannot base an argument on on uh, on the incident of David and Bathsheba because there was a distinction in the Old Testament. So you have to prove 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 your case from from the New Testament and and what it says about the pastoral office. Um, so move on to the next question, and this one 
this one has been discussed. This one came out, actually, there's some kind of discussion last year with the whole um, Me Too movement. And the question is, did David rape Bathsheba? And as it puts in the brackets here, um, not rape in the sense of, like, he, like, you know, forced her down and that kind of um, physical force, but did he use his power... Um, his position of power to coerce her to sleep with him. Um, Magnus, we'll get you to answer this one first then. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I would call that rape, unless it's it coerced. That depends on what you mean mean by that. I mean, if if he forced her somehow, of course it's rape. I, I don't think that you can say that that, that if, if he used his position of power to, to convince her, uh, you can't call that rape. I mean, she's responsible too. So I, I can't say that we can say from scripture that he raped her, but I don't I don't think that using use of power unless it is really coercion that you can call that uh, rape. Mark, I, you know, it's all we have to define the words. You know, um, if if rape means um, coercion uh, in the actual act, um, like we tend that's tend that that's kind of the usus loquendi, the the mode of speaking that people use. Then then no, but I would actually uh advocate for a broader definition of the word and i know you can't prove the meaning of a word from its origin but the origin is helpful here it's it's rape comes from rapio which means <coughs> to snatch in latin and so you have the famous um <coughs> their paintings it's the famous story that Livy tells of the rape of the sabine women have you all have you all heard of that so the romans romulus and remus had um, a bunch of guys that they hung out with, kind of like David, and 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 uh, when he was in the um, wilderness fleeing from Saul, like all these people came to them, and he started he started or they started a town, Rome, but they needed wives, right? And um, so they nobody wanted to marry them and give their daughters in marriage, and so they invited them to a a festival, and um, they had a they had they had preordained that um, at when the flute player stamps his feet however many times, then everybody grab a, grab a girl and take her, right? And so that was the rape of the Sabine women. And so they took them as their wives, but the, so the Sabines got ready for war and, and the Romans got ready for war and they were going to go fight. And then <clears throat> the Sabine women who had been married to these Romans now came and stopped the fight and caused um, and, and brought peace about. In any case, that's a rape in the broader sense is that you 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 take someone in that sense it's you take someone uh for marriage apart from the 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 parents permission mm. well that's that opens things up pretty wide now doesn't it right even if they're willing it's still considered a rape in that regard and i think we need to what are you snatching from once you know that it means snatch okay or take what are you taking from you can't one of the reasons to sin to have sex before you're married is because you are you are taking what doesn't belong to you. So, for example, the, the, uh, a betrothal, the Lutheran dogmaticians and and uh, teachers would say, and the pastors would say in the old days, that it's not a sin against the sixth commandment for a man to have sex with his betrothed because they are. It's it's happened. It's a sin against the fourth because you're taking what the parents haven't officially given you yet, and they're the authority. And then that sense, then. You, it doesn't matter whether the person's willing or not. I mean, that's what we got to get away from in a certain sense, because that's all that determines sexual ethics today is whether a person's willing or not. Well, if they're willing, then it's okay. No, that's not true. It, it, sex is, uh, obviously, it's private in, in, in the act, uh, but it's a public thing. Um, it results in human beings being born into the world that look like you and the other person, you know? So it's, it's I would say that um, also the abuse of power um, is is bad i mean you don't use women are attracted to power and they also often i mean the king summons you to his house at night you sh she should have said no but the king summoned you you know i mean that's 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 a very the, he's using his authority at the very least he's using his authority to take what doesn't belong to him and so all adultery in that sense is rape and and and, and um so you have to be careful obviously using the word rape but we should not we should have higher sexual standards than the feminists who call everything rape and so that's why i'm advocating for a broader understanding at least of it even if we don't use it 
in that way. Sorry for talking too long. That's all right. Um, Matthew, you're last on this question. Any further comments? Yeah, um, I think um, that if we we look at the passage, my, my answer, my my initial gut reaction answer to the question was we don't have enough information. It seems from what Nathan says to David that David's at fault, and he is at fault. But we don't have any data in the scripture about what Bathsheba was doing. Was Bathsheba trying to seduce David? Did she know what she was doing? Like we don't have enough. We don't have enough data to make a definitive judgment um, as to all the culpability in this situation. Um, did David rape her in the old fashioned sense? No, it doesn't seem like he did it in the old fat, the, the strict set. Um, did he use his position to snatch her? She did snatch her. So if you want to even the broadest sense, as Mark is saying, did he use his position of power to con con coerce her to sleep with him? It seems that that's what he did, but barring any data from what Bathsheba was doing, um, I can't say definitively. I can't answer to the the question definitively. Wait, can I can I quickly can I quickly comment on uh, on uh, Marx? Yeah, I think it, broadening the 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 definition of rape. I, that's okay with me if we are, if we're talking about David's sin. Uh, but if we are talking about whether it's excusable for for Batsaba, I think it's another thing. Uh, be, because normally when we speak about rape, we're saying that someone was without fault for for uh, for for someone uh, sleeping with her. And I think when we look at how De Deuteronomy uh, 22 speaks about this, it it clearly says that that if if uh, if it's in the city and she doesn't shout, a betrothed word then she is to be uh, executed and if uh, and if it's on the field where she where she couldn't shout she's not to be executed but only he's is to be executed so i think i agree that 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 i don't think it, it really matters for david's sin whether it's adultery or rape i mean that's his sin is is is, is big uh but whether Bathsheba is without fault that depends on on what on uh, on whether she was coerced or not yeah uh, yeah I I, that's such a good point. And I also, you know, you look at like, with was it Ammon and Tamar, uh, David's kids? That was yeah. very clearly rape. Um, yes. um, I think they're broader. I looked at the Hebrew one time, and I forget the word, but it's, it's, it means to humble her, you know, and, um, and, and, and humiliate her. And it's used br uh, broadly in certain circumstances, but the context defines it. But we have specific examples there's a big difference between what David's son did to his daughter and what David did to Bathsheba. And yet, so there's a connection there. You know, there's a person using his power uh, to get something. Um, he, he summons her as the, as the king. She's guilty. You, you never consent to adultery. You, you, you know, um, but so she went to him. So I think we have enough data as far as that's concerned. She was culpable. Um, but 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 yeah I, as far as the the term rape yeah i i agree I, it's nice to talk about get people to think about but but um they do use it today to say that the other person isn't culpable and that's that we can't use it in that sense um in in, in with david and bathsheba i don't it's she went she went to him and if somebody tells you to sin you even you know we must obey god rather than men so now to, there's this question this podcast is getting long we're going to just uh, fire through questions 10 11 12 these were sent in from someone from the um, orthodox lutheran fellowship group that basically just wants to get your your stance on these questions so we don't need much debate uh so i'll give each of you just to go i'll say all three questions and then each of you can give your all three answers in one go so the questions are what is your stance on universal objective justification? What is your stance on the Semper Virgo? And what is your stance on pineapple on pizza? So, Magnus, go. What is your position on those three questions? Yeah, on universal objective justification, I don't think it's a helpful term. It's not in the Bible or in the Confessions, and it was introduced by an ex-Calvinist and later 
was introduced again as a reaction inside uh, the pietist movement from the, the part of it that was called the Moravians, uh, which had already accepted that fate could not be recognized. It's, it's, it's a wrong solution uh, that does not address the real problem of pietism, but rather assumes it and continues the problem. And it oftentimes ends up denying forensic justification. Uh, justification is a judi judicial verdict, which is one-sided and doesn't need to be accepted by the recipient of the verdict. While adherents of universal objective justification claim that they believe in such a verdict before faith, they really don't. Because if they did, they would be universalists, which they aren't. Uh, so in order to make this scheme work, they do, however oftentimes end up denying the actual forensic verdict of justification that follows uh, the individual's apprehension of Christ and his righteousness. Uh, so I believe we can speak about a universal objective righteousness existing in Christ on account of his work and declared in his resurrection. And this righteousness is bestowed on man through the means of grace and apprehended by man through faith. And when this faith has uh, united a person with Christ and his righteousness, He's justified by imputation of that righteousness. Uh, thus, forensic, the forensic verdict of justification is a result of man having apprehended Christ and his universal righteousness. And on uh, Semper Virgo, what's the next one? I believe in Semper Virgo, but I do not consider it doctrine. Uh, regarding uh, pineapple on pizza, I will say I'm generally against mixing fruit and non-desserts. I know Americans feel different about this. I've, I saw that very soon when I came to America. Uh, but I'm against this, and I'm also against, so I'm therefore also against uh, pineapple on pizza. I do see some parallels in mosaic purity laws, uh, but I cannot deduce my stance from scripture. But it seems <laughs> to me to be a natural consequence of Aristotelian reasoning from the final course of things that you should not mix fruit and non-desserts. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> um, Mark, we'll let, you, we'll let you go next. He was delivered up for our tra trespasses and raised for our justification. It doesn't matter whether it's because of your justification or for. Um, and so I, it's good that, you know, there's a declaration there. I understand the, um, uh, I've, I've heard objective justification preached non-forensically. I've also heard it preached um, apart from, uh, I've, he I've heard the, the imputation preached apart from the atonement. And so those, those are things you have to, you have to guard against. But yeah, when, when God, uh, if one died for all, then all died. It's true before you believe it. Um, it is the forgiveness of sins. And, um, I don't know, uh, I've never understood how, um, you know, he reconciled the world to himself and that's not universalism, but, but but justification uh, would be, um, but that's I I'd, I'd love to have a longer debate about this. Um, if one died for all, then all died. It's, that's a reckoning. We the love of Christ compels us. We we judge this way, um, and so that's that's uh, and it's based upon his death and resurrection. So and I don't, I think that also every other synonym like uh, uh, you know you have universal reconciliation and then. They say, be reconciled to God, which is the apprehension of that through faith. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to go, uh, that's as much as I'll say, because I'd rather have a good, I'm not going to say things that will make Magnus want to, you know, have a good conversation, because I would really like to have a good conversation about this. But that, I'll stop right there. What is my stance on the Semper Virgo? I just, I just don't care. I, I really don't. I've held to it. I've not held to it. And I just don't care. Um, it's just not that important. Um and I mean, as far as my love for the Blessed Virgin, and and she she's a wonderful saint, and I can't wait to see her in heaven. And she, uh, I call her Blessed um, every day, and uh, and so I'm and and, and she, I, te I learned so much from her example that I don't need the the um, Semper Virgo to have that blessedness. As far as my stance on pineapple on pizza, I I think that the sweet and the savory should be um, enjoyed together. For example, you can have a good cheese. You ever eat cheese with fruit, Magnus? You can you can do that, can't you? Or like right? No, like you have, no, no, you don't you no, can't you can't put no, a piece of brie on an apple? That's French. No, no. Put brie on an apple. It's amazing. I think that what happened what happens to the Scandinavians, and I know because I'm half Scandinavian, is that they get they 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 they, they get 
put into these categories. I think the Germans did it to them. And and uh, they get put into these categories and then they can't get out of them. And so they can't enjoy things that that um, God created to be enjoyed with Thanksgiving, including pineapple on pizza. And I would I would just say that a normal Hawaiian thing, pineapple's a bit sweet, so you got to keep not so much pineapple. But um, you generally, the sweetness with ham and other uh, Italian meats with the, oh, it's just excellent. It's an excellent combination. And uh, yeah, so this is why Magnus and I are not in fellowship. So <laughs> because of our stance on pineapple and pizza. Yeah, ex- exactly. <laughs> and Matthew, your answers to these three questions uh universal objective justification um i I, um i think that the distinction between objective justification and subjective justification should probably not be used because i i think that it starts to blend the atonement with justification i prefer to talk like the confessions talk forgiveness is obtained by christ offered to us in the gospel and we uh uh receive it by faith uh, i i i like to talk uh use those categories talk like that better um i, I agree with um um uh, magnus's um uh da, 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 his, his the history of it with uh huber so I, I I I think it can be understood in a correct way, but I've also seen it misused by Ferdians and the like. So I I tend to make a sharper distinction between justification, because uh, Scripture tends to almost always refer to justification as the thing that happens to me when I receive the gospel, uh, the promises of the gospel by faith. Um, and so that's what I'll stick with. Uh, Simba Virgo, absolutely. It's part of Orthodox Christology, always has been. It's a decree of the ecumenical councils, the ones that we actually agree to and are cited in the Book of Concord. It's in the Book of Concord, uh, so every Lutheran pastor is bound to keep it because it's in the Book of Concord. Um, <laughs> this is um, not true. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not supposed to argue. This is not true. <laughs> I, I said that because I know I could go, I, I, I said that so flippantly because I know I could sneak away with it and you wouldn't be able to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, um, man. That was good. <laughs> um, <laughs> You're not the first price I've encountered. <laughs> um, and pineapple belongs on Hawaiian pizza and no other. Um, before we wrap up, I just wanted to quick take a chance. I, I like to participate in these panels sometime, even though I'm the host and not one of the panelists. But I'd like to just quick give the rapid fire answer to these. Um, myself, um, I'm in fellowship with Magnus. We have the exact same position on universal objective justification. That's kind of why we're in fellowship the Semper Virgo, uh, personally, I don't agree with Semper Virgo. I just kind of, too many things I look at it and think that I think Joseph and Mary just did do that kind of marital stuff after they were married. Um, as for Hawaiian pizza, this is like pineapple on pizza. Uh, for anyone who actually knows me, they'll know that I actually only ever eat Hawaiian pizza. So I don't actually like any other types of pizza. So... I, I, I hope I hope it's permissible to eat Hawaiian pizza because it's the only one I eat. How can you be in fellowship with Magnus? <laughs> How can you be in fellowship it's, with Magnus? I don't get this. It's like with the coffee. He didn't tell me before I ordained him. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So before we get to our final question, which is I have for every panel for the year 2020, I just do what I've been doing this year and remind everybody that the Order of Knight George has our own publishing house. We publish some books. We've reprinted some um, old Lutheran Australian books. I publish my own books. Each month we have our own book of the month. And for this we have the Australian Evangelical Lutheran Commentary. This book is um, it's a collection of exegetical articles written by Pastor Clarence Primino of the Australian Evangelical Lutheran Church, which has been compiled into like a commentary format. So it's not a complete Bible commentary. It's just a collection of exegetical articles on different um, different passages in Scripture. And that's our book of the month. It's $15 from Lulu. You can buy that if you'd like. And so we'll move on to our final question which is 
what is your favourite writing of Martin Luther and why? And can you give a bit of an explanation about what... Can you give a bit of an explanation about what this document says? Cool, we'll get Matthew then. Uh, the preface to the Romans. Um, not the commentary, and it's not the preface to that commentary, but the, his preface to the Romans, which is part of his New Testament prefaces. Uh, I think it's really good. It's, it's a great work. Um, what I love about it is how clearly he defines certain things like grace, faith, works, and he lays out a good uh, chunk of Romans, and, and uh, it's just really, I find that really helpful. I, I keep going back to those uh, definitions that where, where he's talking about grace, faith, and works, and the law. He just lays it out so nicely in that preface to the Romans, and, and I think it's, I love it. Cool. Well, you need to go, so I'll let you go, and then we'll get Mark to give his answer. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Thanks for talking. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I, I like the small catechism. It's my favorite writing um, because it is I, I never it never ceases to amaze me with its clarity and its practical use in my daily life and i've been teaching it uh, as a pastor for almost 10 years and i did my to my and to my children and i love it very much but besides the small catechism you could add the large catechism to that i really enjoy um his commentary on the galatians my dad gave me a copy when i was 18 and i go and I just read it occasionally, and it's just beautiful. His just the the freedom of the gospel and his explanation um, is, is going after the legalists and the antinomians. It's, I think it is very very pertinent for today. Um, and then bondage of the will, of course, is just amazing. And um, it, it it just it sobers you up. It gets you to think about things as long as you keep reading formula of Concord Article Eleven too on election. It, it's just uh, wonderful. So yeah, those are my favorite works of Luther. But I've recently been re reading um, Tappert's Letters of Spiritual Counsel, which are amazing. And um, and they are they're very yeah. Good. Especially read the uh, to the sick and dying. Now this is really pertinent stuff. Very good, very good stuff. So um, and Magnus, what is your favorite Martin Luther writing and why? Uh, well, I've been reading the the, the letters of pastoral council uh, recently too, and I think they're great. I think my favorite writing is uh, is either the the church pastoral or his Galatians commentary. I think I'll I think I'll say the Galatians commentary. Uh, he goes into many important theological topics, uh, of course, justification, uh, but also atonement and how to deal with false doctrine and sanctification. And uh, I like especially how he shows how justification is based, of course, on atonement, but also on our union with uh, the resurrected Christ and sharing in his righteousness, so something that is often overlooked. Uh, and I think he, uh, I think, I think the Galatians commentary is, is very good at that. And if you, and, but you have to, you have to uh, use it together with the formula of Concord. So, so that you don't get uh, too found on this uh, union with Christ. But I think it is an aspect of justification that uh, and, and, and uh, the formula of Concord refers to the Galatians commentary. Uh, so that will be my cool. choice. Well, thank you both for coming on. And thank Matt as well, but he's gone already. So thank you both for coming on and taking time out of your schedules for this panel. I hope the listeners have enjoyed the questions and yeah thanks for listening listeners thanks jake it's wonderful to be here yeah thank you